Now, uh, who's, who's married here? Where's my married people at? Who remembers when you get, now who remembers that before you get married, you have the engagement party? Who remembers their engagement party? Anyone actually remember their engagement party? Can you remember that? Can you, can you remember the people that were there? Can you sort of picture a few of their faces? Can you remember, you know, uh, uh, what sort of food you had or anything like that? Can you remember the pile of gifts that you were given? Does anyone remember the gifts? I remember the pile of gifts that we got. At, uh, at our engagement party. And it was nice to have these, these big polygons. And I remember at the end of the night, um, I'm not sure if this is customary or not, but we kind of did it like this. But in the night, um, people kind of hung around and we, and we opened the gifts, right? Is that customary? Is that what, did you sort of do that? Is it wrong? Okay. Sort it out. All right. But we, we opened the gifts and people were there and we watched. And I remember, I remember opening the gifts and going through it, and look, i got to tell you, I was disappointed, <laughs> right? Cups, plates, sauces, haberdashery, you know, like, just like, yay, another tea towel, whoa, like, now, now it's all good stuff, right? It's all stuff that you need, but seriously, like, I, I can get away with one plate and one cup, like, that's all I need. I don't even really need a knife and fork. You know, I can, I can manage. I can manage, right? And then I remember looking, we're going through these gifts and we're opening all these gifts and I'm kind of waiting for like the spanner set, some spanners. Give me some spanners. Give me, give me a battery drill. You know, like give me something that I can use, you know, like, but it was all serving plates. I've, I say I, but it's not me. We, my wife has a whole like cupboard full of platters. Like, how many oversized white plates do you need? Like, we just got it. You know, every now and then I'll just get a platter out and eat dinner off of it because I just want to use it. I just want to use it, right? So it's like, and it makes me feel healthier because the plate's so big and the food is, it's like a health, it's like a health thing, right? Just, it's all up here, just tricking myself, right? You got all these, all these gifts, right? And I was disappointed. So being, you know, someone of, uh, you know, just being able to sort of gather myself up and not, you know, kind of let things throw me off. I, uh, no, I didn't. I, I just let everyone knew. Like, I just told everyone after, this is stupid. There's nothing here for me. Right? This is dumb. You know, like, and uh, I wasn't happy. And, uh, and, I, and I let people, you know, some of the people around me know that, you know, this engagement thing, it's a, it's a bit of a joke, really. You know, like, like all these, all these gifts, but not one thing for me, right? So fast forward, fast forward a few months later, and uh, it comes to the wedding day, right? And uh, of course, who remembers their wedding day? You remember, you put your hand up for that one, guys. Put your hand up for that one. Don't. Engagement, you'll get away with. Wedding, you won't get away with that one, all right? So remember the wedding day, and it's all nice, and it was fantastic. And uh, um, of course, you don't hang around to open presents. Um, no need to go further than that. And so, uh, and so we, were, we were on our way out. And, uh, you know, it was a great day, it was well celebrated and all that. And then a couple of buddies of mine came up to me and they said, JB, we've got a gift for you. I'm like, really? That's, I guess, I go, well, you know, well, we've got to go now. They said, no, no, we've got it here. We, we want you to open it now. And so I got the gift and I opened it up and it was a signed Richmond football club, signed by the Richmond football club. Now, hopefully on Saturday, this might actually be worth something at the moment. It's just a football, but, uh, but it's got some names on there and it was all, it was all signed and all that. And they came and they brought me this gift and I was like, they were like, we heard you complaining, you know, like last time. So, so we got you something that you would like. And I, they gave, and I really, this was very nice. And they got me my signed Richmond football club. Football. Very nice. Signed by all the players from 2005 or whatever it was. So, you know, sometimes, in our walk with God, we can go through these seasons, right, where you have all this expectation but get nothing. And then when there's no expectation, like, good things seem to happen. You, you know what I mean? Like, have you been through seasons like that? Where you're walking with God and you've got all this faith and expectation, hard, you're believing God for all these things and nothing happens. And then other times in your walk, you just... You're just cruising on through, not really thinking, just kind of going about life. And then it's just like, it's like the windows of heaven are open. 
And it's just everything's just happening. And it's just, and we go through these seasons. We go through these things. You know, you, you can sometimes feel like saying to God, you know, God, what is it? Am I in the wilderness or am I in the promised land? Like, God, just make up your mind. All right, just let me know which one it is. And then I can deal with it and get on with it. You know, like, we kind of, we, we, we're not sure where you're at. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, like. Now, while I don't propose necessarily to have an answer to why it's like that, because in the, the day, God is God and God will be God and God can do whatever God wants to do. He doesn't need my advice or anyone else for that matter and what he wants to do, right? But I think the danger in all of that for us in our faith is that sometimes we can come to a place where it's easier to have no expectation and not be disappointed than to have expectation and feel let down. So we can have a faith that whilst we love God, we, we, we love all that Jesus has done for us and it's fantastic, it's all good, but we never actually take steps to activate our faith or to walk in faith because if I'm walking in faith and it doesn't work out, then what do I do? If I have a level of expectation and that expectation isn't met, then I'm just left with disappointment. And because I can never be disappointed at God, then it's just better just not to expect. And so we find ourselves in this conundrum. We, we find ourselves in this, in this circumstance where, you know, to have faith and not to have faith. You know, we can, we, it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad place to be. To have no expectation. You know, if you think about your close relationships with each other, you know, whilst having too much expectation can be damaging, having no expectation almost feels disconnected. Feels, it feels like distance. You know, Joe just recently got married to Yovana and he enjoyed a great day there. And Joe invited me to the wedding and that was very nice. And we have a relationship. We have a, we have a working close relationship. Now, if there was no expectation there from him that I would even want to be there or turn up, then that shows a level of disconnect, right? Can, can you see that? So, so whilst having too much expectation can be damaging in relationship, having no expectation of all is like, well, we're just, we're just ships in the night. We're just passing on by. And I think sometimes in our walk with God, we can have that approach. Like me and God, we're just ships in the night. Every now and then, on a Sunday, we, we cross paths and then we just continue on our own walk. But is that really what God would want for us? Is, is, is that really the posture that we should take as Christians? Is that really how, is, is that the dynamic Christian life that Jesus has, has died for us, has given to us? You know, I, I of course, don't believe that that's, what God would have for us. You know, I believe that God wants to take us from a place where we don't just have faith to believe, but we have faith to receive. That we don't just believe the stories and the things that were written and, and, and we hear testimonies and things that go, well, gee, that's great for that person over there, but I'm just, I'm just going about my non-expectant journey. But that all of us actually come to a place where we don't just believe and, and, and have those thoughts, but we actually receive what, what it is that God wants to give us. We actually receive the promises that he has prepared for us. You know, the, tr the truth is, though, for, for many of us is that we, we, we live in that gap, don't we? We live in that space between believing and receiving. We, we live in that scale. We, we're somewhere along that line. You know, tonight I want to look at the account of, uh, of Zechariah and Sarah. Because I think it gives us a great example of, of how to live in the gap. How to live in that place from believing to receiving. And, and how we get more on the receiving side, the expectant side, than just uh, living without hope. I'm going to read tonight from, uh, from Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to start from, uh, from verse 5. And it says this, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife uh, from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, 
and they were both advanced in years. Now, I believe right there that God wants to speak to some people tonight, that God wants to release you some, from some things tonight. Elizabeth and Zechariah are good people, godly people, living righteous. You know, they're, 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 they're following the statue. They're doing everything that God has told them to do. That they're pursuing God. They're, they're doing their best. They're giving their all. They've put themselves in the place where, you know, that they're serving. They're doing all the different things. But there's a problem. They don't have a child. And, and for them, in that time, in that culture, having no children was put you in a tough spot. You know, that not only were they in that culture, in that environment, where not having a child meant that that there was potentially some kind of secret sin that you were harboring or, or that some, some ancestor had some sin that happened that is somehow now preventing you from having children. But not only that, but he's a priest. He, he's the one that's supposed to have answers. He, he's the one that you invite around to, to pray over the house and to pray for your family. Well, who wants the guy who doesn't even have any kids? Who, who wants that priest to come to their house? You know, they're in a tough Spot. You know, it's an issue that would, that looked them in the face every day. It was an issue that they were challenged with every day, with with no seemingly answer. But this wasn't a punishment for them. This wasn't a cause and effect. This wasn't this wasn't something that God had God had you know cursed them with or put upon them. You know, in fact, we read later as we go into the story, we see that this was actually an opportunity for God to show His grace and His love. And I want to tell you tonight that if you're here and you've got, there's something in your life, something in your walk, where for no fault of your own, it's just there. It's just happened. Can I tell you tonight, it's it's, it's not a punishment. It's not that you're a bad person. It's not that you made a mistake 10 years ago, therefore you have to suffer from now until eternity, and this is the way it is, and too bad, that's just tough luck. That's not what it is. It's actually a space and a place for God to show His graciousness, His love, His kindness. It's actually a space for God to move. It's actually an opportunity where God can be God and display His love for you. Display His love for you. Don't believe what others say. Don't believe that you deserve it. Because if we lived in an environment where we all got we deserved, all of us would be in big trouble. But that's not what Jesus offers us. That's not what Jesus died for. Those things in our life that are just there. It's just just what it is. It's a space for God to show his love. And to show his grace. The verse goes on in verse 8. It says, Now while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, they were chosen by lot, Pastor Mark. They were rolling dice, throwing dice in the temple. They were were rolling dice, chosen by lot, to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And then the the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. So here's the first thing that I want us to see in this passage that help us go from believing to receiving. Is that sometimes you just got to keep turning up. You just got to you just got to keep going. You just got to be there because you just because in the, the day you never know when your numbers up. You you never know when the roll of the dice is going to go the way for you. You you, you don't know when that's going to happen. And so just keep turning up. Just keep being there. Just keep going. Keep serving. Keep putting yourself in the place because you just never know when the breakthrough is going to happen. You know, what if Zechariah was late that day? What if on that day he decided to grab that extra 15 minute sleep in rather than get up and get going? What, what if on that day Zechariah decided, you know what? I'm a priest. I didn't have kids. This is hopeless. I'm just going to stay in bed. They, they don't really need me. There's enough, there's other people there. There's other priests there. They can, they can do it. You just go in and burn the stuff and, you know, it all kind of happens. So, well, I, I might as well just, I'll just stay home. See, you just got to keep turning up. You just got to keep putting yourself in the place. Just be faithful. Just continue just, just turning up again and again. 
You know, Zechariah is serving God. He's not using God for his own means. But he's serving God. See, the truth is, if Zechariah if Zachariah was driven by his issue, then the temple wouldn't be the place to be. It would be at home with his wife because that's where babies come from, all right? His issue is he couldn't have children. So if he wants to solve that issue, then the place he needs to be is with his wife, not in the temple. But he was serving. He was serving. He was putting himself in that place, in that position for God to move. You see, you never know when your number's going to come up. You never know when, when, when it's going to be you. you. You just, you never know. You know, all of us here tonight face issues and challenges and hardships, have things in our life that we struggle with. But friend, keep turning up. Keep, keep coming. Don't let those issues be the motivator. Don't let those issues be, be the thing that, that, well, if I just solve this issue, then everything will be better. No, go after God. Just pursue after God. You pursue after him and everything else takes care of itself. You know, it takes courage to keep turning up. It takes faith to keep turning up. Think about Zechariah. No kids in that culture, in that time. He's a priest. It took courage to keep going along every week. It took courage to keep turning up, knowing what potentially people might have thought or said about him when he wasn't there. But he kept turning up. He kept going. You know, if you want to have faith to receive, then just keep turning up, keep serving, keep putting others first, keep living for God. Don't give up on doing good. You know, this week, we've got summit. Starts Thursday night. Keep turning up. You may have come last year. You may have come what is it, for fourth one, fifth one. You may have come at other times. You may have gone to every other conference, everything out there. But still that issue is there. Still that challenge is there every morning looking at you in the face. Friend, keep turning up. Don't give up in doing good. Keep pushing. Keep believing. Keep expecting God to move because you never know. Maybe this Thursday night is your night. Maybe it's not Thursday. Maybe it's Friday morning. Maybe it's Friday, maybe it's Saturday, maybe it's Sunday with Andrew Stone, maybe it's on Monday, maybe it's tonight. I don't know, but but if it's there, why not turn up? Keep turning up. Keep going. Don't become weary in doing good. Don't miss an opportunity. Because we became lax with it. We, We treated it as ordinary an opportunity, friend, for you to connect with God. You know, this morning, uh, Julie shared a great word this morning, by the way. If you weren't here, I encourage you to listen to the podcast. It's just excellent. It's all about our speech. And it's so important. And I'll, even just when I shared later on tonight, just touching on some of those things about what comes out of our mouth is so important. And at the end of one of the services, I was here with Julie and, uh, and uh, one of the uh, members of the church just came over to us and just asked us to go and pray uh, for, the, for their spouse. And to go and pray for them because this, this person is, is struggling with sickness, struggling with health, and, and just getting out of bed in the morning is a struggle in his heart. And, and this, this is the thing that blew me away, is they came and they asked us to pray. And the prayer wasn't so much about that they would be healed or, or anything like that, but their prayer was that they could be in summit. That was their prayer. Their prayer was that they wanted to come to summit, they have these issues, they have these limitations, but they don't want that to be the thing that defines them or stops them from being in the presence of God. Let me tell you, that is, that's an unbelievable statement of faith right there. Because they're not focusing on the issue or the challenge or the hardship saying, God, just take this away. God, why is this like this? God, why is this hard? They're saying, no, I want to be in the presence of God. I want to be in the place where God can move. That is an amazing testimony of faith and courage right there. Right there. You know, even if God, whatever happens, happens. But let me tell you right there, that's a statement of faith right there. That, that outmeasures any great miracle, right? Do you, do you understand that? Do you understand the heart is not the issue. The heart is, I just want to be in the presence of God. I just want to be in a place where, where I don't want to miss out. I don't want to not be able to be there to connect with God. That is just amazing. That is just, it's just amazing. Something in that for all of us that we can learn. 
the scripture goes on in verse 11. It says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. He has been praying. He's been praying. He hasn't stopped. He hasn't given up. Others might say he hasn't, but he hasn't. He's kept praying. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Great word. But the Bible says that Zechariah, he, he's afraid. He is troubled at this. You know, I, I believe in this moment that, you know, this isn't a, a fear of like, you know, going into a dark room or this isn't like a, a fear like that. But as I read this and as I think about this, I, I, I believe that in this moment, Zechariah, he's, he's doing the, the internal checklist. He's doing the internal checklist. You know, it's like, God's moving, something's happening, and all of a sudden he starts going, all right, have, have I done the right thing? Did, did I bring in enough incense? Was it the right incense? Was it supposed to be pot puree day and I brought in, you know, something else? You know, like, like, like he's going through this internal, is my tunic on the right way? You know, because last, last week I put it on back to front or something. You know, like, like he's going through this internal checklist. You know, like when your phone rings and, and the boss's name is at the top, right? Before you answer the phone, you're going, yeah, did I do that? Did I, did I ask that? I, I've never, ever been here. This has never happened to me, right? And you're going through. Did I do? I did do that. Oh, wait. I hope he doesn't ask about that. Oh, wait. Okay, good. You know, like, he's going through the internal checklist, you know? Like, you know, or, or, or you know, in your relationship, you know, your, your spouse comes to you and says, honey, we need to talk. You know, like, straight away, you're like, okay, wait, hang on a minute. Wait, I did that. Did I do that? Oh, I'm not sure can't be about the palm fronds, can it? You know, like, oh, no, the garden. You know, like, like, it's the internal checklist. He's going through all the things that could be potentially wrong. He's, he's looking, he's immediately looking at himself going, what are the issues? What have I done? What haven't I done? What didn't I do? What was I supposed to do? do I, have, have I messed this up? Did I not do that right? You know, it's an easy thing for us to do. When we're in that environment, we're here in worship. You know, Selena, they've been led us so well tonight. And you're here with your hands around your worship, and all of a sudden it's like, did you pray enough this week? Did you read your Bible enough? Were you listening to worship in your car on the way, or ABC, or were you, did you, did you respond the right way in this place, or you didn't, you didn't do this right, or this didn't happen, and we start going through our own internal checklists of all the things that are wrong with us, of all the reasons why God can't move. We start looking at all the what's wrong with us. But right here, God shows us. Right here in this instant, He shows us how we go from believing to receiving. Is that it's not about what's wrong with us, but it's about what's right with Him. When you're having that moment, in worship, at home in your own prayer time, and that internal checklist starts to come up in your mind. You start thinking about all the things that you haven't done or that you were going to do or, or that you wish you had done. That's not, it's not about you. It's not about what you have or haven't done or what you should or shouldn't have done. But it's about who Jesus is. It's about what he did for you. It's about that He made the way for us. He made it possible. Every bless, everything that comes from Him. It begins and ends with Him. And so I don't have to go through that. I don't have to look at all the things that disqualify me because it's Jesus that makes me qualify. It's, it's, it's Jesus that I have. It's because of Him and what He has done. See, receiving is not about us but it's about God and who He is. 
Verse 18 says, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. See, I, I, I like Zechariah for this. I think he's worded this very well. All right? I'm an old man, and my wife, she, she, she's advanced in years. You know, I think, I think he did that very well. He's, he's, he's thinking this guy, right? And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which would be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. Good man. And for, and for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when, when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. Zechariah gets this great promise. You're going to have a son. He's going to be great. He's going to do all these great things. God's going to use him. It's going to be amazing. He's going to prepare the way. There's this great promise that comes. It's, it's amazing news. It's great news. But Zechariah, he has an issue, right? And to be fair, it's a legitimate issue. He's old and his wife is advanced in years, right? It's a legitimate issue. And he, and he outlines that to the, to the angel. Now, I believe that in his response, that's, the issue wasn't so much about the fact that, of the, that he had this legitimate issue. You know, like, like, like it's a real thing. He was old. She was old. This is going to be hard, right? I, God understands the issues that you and I have, right? It's, it's not about the issue. It's, it's, it's not about, because he knows. He knows those things. He knows that they're there. He knows that we face those challenges. So if God was to take issue with our issues, then like, I, I don't know where to begin with that, right? Because we're, just, we're all just in trouble together, right? So it wasn't the issue wasn't the issue. Are you, are you following me? See, because at the end of the day, our issues are not issues for God. God, he's the creator of the earth with a footstool, all that kind of like He can do whatever he wants, right? So issues for him, our issues are not his issues, right? So what's the, what's, what's the issue? I believe the, what happens here and, and the principle that we see here, the, the problem really here is in his question where he says, how can I know this? It's not so much that he identifies the issue, it's in the question, how can I know this? There is no faith in that question. And really, his question is directed at the character of God. He's saying, God, how can you do this? See, we can, we can identify the issue with God. God knows the issues that we have. There's no, like, there's no sense, there's no hiding in any of that. But we never bring God's character into question. We, 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 we don't, we don't bring, we, that is never an issue. And see, what we see here is that his question is directed at God's character. You know, and, and, that, and that's part of the gap between believing and receiving. That's part of that gap. You know, I believe God, but it never works out. You know, I believe God can heal. I heard a story once about someone who got a healing, but I, I never see it. It never really happens for me. You know, once, you know, I heard a story about someone who, you know, they got one of those magic envelopes in their, you know, in their, in their letterbox and they got, you know, God bless them with money. And we, we hear those things, but that never happens for me. That's, that's never my thing. You see, that's the gap between believing and receiving. Is when we say things like that. When we talk like that. I believe you, God, but it just, it just never works in, and you know what? If I have expectation, I, I just don't know if I can deal with being let down. And so better just to have no expectation and just leave it at that, God, and let's just continue this kind of ships in the night style rather than actually believe that God could do something. You know, I'm so glad that God doesn't operate on our logic. I'm so glad that God doesn't think like us. 
And God in this instance does something so loving, so amazing, so gracious in this instance. He shuts him up. That is the most gracious and loving. You're laughing, but it's true. It is the most gracious and loving thing that God does in this circumstance. He shuts him up. Because God is so committed to the promises in your life that if it means having to shut you up so they can be fulfilled, He will shut you up. God is so committed to seeing the promises fulfilled, the words spoken. God is so committed to seeing those things happen that sometimes He takes us out of the picture so that promise can be fulfilled. See, sometimes we're the ones who need to actually get out of the way and let, allow God to move rather than we're actually, we actually are the ones who stand in the way. We're actually the, bar- we're actually the bottleneck. But God is so loving and kind and gracious that He will shut you up so that the promise can be fulfilled. You know, the Bible says that He is faithful even when we are faithless. So even when you're at your lower, even when you're at that place where you're saying, God, I can't expect for anything, God, because I just don't want to be like, even when you are faithless, He is faithful to you. He is faithful to the words spoken. He is faithful to the promises. He is, he is faithful to the vision and the dream. And He is faithful to the purpose for which He designed you for. He is faithful. And sometimes He even shuts us up. You know, there's some things, and, and Julie touched on this this morning, so well, there's some things that we should just never say. That, that There's just some words that just should never leave our mouths. I'm not talking about swear words, although that's a good one too. All right? But there's some things that you should never leave our mouth. Things like, I give up. Things like, this is just who I am. I don't even want to say, I've got things, I don't, I don't want to say them because I don't want to verbalize them. All right? Because there's promises that God's given me over my family, over my ministry over the plans and purposes he has for my life, that no matter what comes along, I'm not going to speak any words against those things. I will be mute to those things. I will not stand in the way of what God wants to do. I will not allow my words. I'm not going to speak things over my children, no matter how much they annoy me sometimes, right? I'm not going to let those words escape my mouth. Because I don't want to forfeit or, 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 or any of those things of the promise. I don't want to be the barrier. I don't want to be the blockage. I don't want to be the one who's standing in the way for God to move. But He's gracious and kind and sometimes He just shuts us up. Let me just get the band back right now, please. We jump on ahead in the same passage and we come to uh, when at the birth of John, verse 57. It says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him um, Zachariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives are called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. Verse 64 says, And immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, and he spoke blessing God. And fear came on all the neighbors, and all these things were talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. Heard them laid, uh, laid them up in their hearts, saying, "Then what this? What, what will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was on him." And then it says this uh, at the beginning of top of in my Bible, the top of uh, verse sixty-seven says, "Zachariah's prophecy," and that's where we're going to land in a moment. His prophecy, verse sixty-seven says, "And his father Zachariah was filled with the Holy Spirit, and prophesied, and 
and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited and redeemed His people, and He has raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David, as He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and that from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy promise to our fathers and remember His holy covenant, the oath that He swore to our fathers Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hands of enemies, might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him uh, all of our days. And you, child, will be called the most prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people and in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Verse 18 says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. The baby is born. Everyone gathers around. It's great celebration. It's amazing. Oh my goodness. The old dog, he did it, right? Everyone's gathered around. They're all together celebrating this birth and they come to the naming of the child. And after a little bit of back and forward, they find he, he writes, his name will be John. And we see that right in that instant, his tongue is loosed. And right at that instant, he doesn't say, well, gee, I'm glad that's over and done with. Wow, I've been wanting to, you know, tell you to do the dishes or something. Like, his tongue's not loose with any words like that. His tongue's not loose with, his tongue is loose to prophesy and to speak life over the promise. Because who knows, whilst the baby is born, the promise is not yet fulfilled. The baby wasn't born, came out, picked up his little tunic, trundled out to the wilderness and started like, there was a process there. There was still a time from what had to happen from the promise of the baby being born to actually fulfilling the promise of preparing the way of the Lord. There's a time gap there. There's, there's a preparing that needs to happen. But all that time through that preparation, Zechariah is speaking faith. Zechariah is speaking life. Zechariah is prophesying. He's, he's putting John around the right people. He's putting John into the right situation. He's, he's preparing. He's nurturing. He's growing. He's, he's, he's activating. He's walking in the promise. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. The guy's not out there doing it yet. But the whole time he's nurturing. He's speaking over it. He's prophesying. He's believing. He's expectant. He's praying. He's, he's pushing in. He's still serving. He's, he's doing his duty. He's doing all of the things because the promise wasn't yet fulfilled. But this time it's different to the first time. See, the first time was how and the issues and the problems and all the things. This time, it's words of faith. This time, he's prophesying. This time, he's speaking over that thing. That this time, he's got words of faith on his lips. But why don't you stand with me right now? Zechariah nurtured the promise. He was deliberate in all that he did. He was deliberate in positioning John and doing things to give him the best opportunity, to put him in the best place to fulfill the Word of God. How about the promises in your life? Are you nurturing them? Are you speaking life over them? Are you putting them in the right place? Are you, are, are, you, are you being deliberate in the promise? Are you being deliberate in your pursuit of the call of God? Or for you, is it just, well, if it happens, it happens. I've got no expectation. If it happens, well, that'd be nice, but I don't want to be disappointed. Or are you living in faith? Are you prophesying? Are you putting yourself in the position to receive? not just believe? Are you putting yourself in that place? There's three things to remember. Stay in the game. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't lose grip of your expectation. Keep believing. Keep believing. Second thing to remember, it's not about you. It's not about what you can and can't do. It's about who He is and what He has done for us. 
The third thing is speak life. Prophesy. Prophesy. You know, as you've heard us talk and share about a summer, we have a prophet coming. But all of us can prophesy. All of us can speak words of life. All of us can speak over those things. You know, for some of you, for some of you tonight, the promises and the words that God has spoken over your life, you have deliberately limited expectation because you don't want to be disappointed. You've deliberately gone, well, I, I just, if it happens, it happens. I just, I, because I just don't know if I can deal with that. Tonight, I want you to believe again. Let expectation fill your heart again. You know, I'm going to ask the band to begin to play. They're just going to play whatever your song you're doing now. Just keep that progression going. But what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to do number three. And right where you're standing, in fact, why don't you just close your eyes right now and just lift your hands. Don't let that internal that internal checklist for some of you is happening right now. Don't do it. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Focus on Him. And I want you to do something brave tonight. I want you to step out in faith. Zachariah's tongue was loosed but it was up to him to speak the words of life and so for you right now where you're standing with your hands raised you know the promises you know the words God spoke and you know those things I want to ask you to step out in faith and right where you're standing you begin to prophesy over those things you begin to speak life over those promises